Hi, I'm Amelia Abraham and I wrote a book called Queer Intentions and I'm very honoured to say that it's nominated for the Polari Prize. Um, it's a first person work of journalism where I travel around the West exploring the um, mainstreaming of queer culture and politics and essentially um, examine what the idea of equality means and who um, it does and doesn't include. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit from a conversation I had with an amazing um, black trans activist called Lala Zanel, um, where we're sitting in her office um, in, at the Anti-Violence Project in New York, and I'm just kind of reflecting of, a bit on um, what she's told me. There was a pregnant pause. I'd been in Lala's tiny office for 30 minutes, and I had accidentally welled up twice but stopped myself crying because it would have been too self-indulgent to cry about a problem that didn't affect me. It was a given that I had no frame of reference for experiencing transphobia or racism and that I would never know that experience. But the conversation was, quite unexpectedly, reminding me of experiences I'd had as a woman but tried to forget. Experiences that made me feel powerless. Slurs, sexual harassment from strangers on dark streets at nights or sexual assault by people I knew. The irony in all of this was that at home, 3,500 miles from where Lala and I were sitting, a war was raging between some cisgender women and trans women. Mostly playing out in the pages of the British mainstream media, feminist writers were penning transphobic articles for big newspapers, and they were somehow getting published. Self-describing feminists were taking to Twitter to say that trans women were not women or that they posed a threat to society. The argument often made was that if we let trans people self-determine their gender, it would allow anyone to use gendered spaces like female toilets or changing rooms, putting cis women at risk of assault. I'd never had any doubt that using trans women as the thin end of the wedge in a conversation about toxic masculinity and rape culture was dangerous. I'd written about it in newspapers and I'd watched my trans friends dealing with the mental health fallout of these unwarranted and vile accusations. But now, during my conversation with Lala, it was really hitting home not just how perverse it was to suggest that the trans people we were talking about, under extreme threat of violence and living in fear, might be a threat to others, but also what an oversight it was. These British feminists were trying to create a divide between cis women and trans women, when really the threat trans people and cis women had historically faced were the same. Domestic violence, rape, murder. Every individual's circumstances were different, sure, but we had a con common enemy, violence at the hands of patriarchy. And furthermore, when it came to seeking justice for this violence, the law disadvantaged us both. Call a hate crime a hate crime, I thought, when I was later reading about Kettery Johnson, the teenager killed in Iowa, and learned that the killers were not charged with a hate crime because state law only included race, religion, and sexual orientation as grounds. Or the case of Ali Lee Steinfeld, the trans woman killed in Missouri, the county sheriff maintained that the murder was not a hate crime before adding that all murders were acts of hate. When a cis woman is killed for just for being a woman because her life is not so valuable, that is also not classed as a hate crime. In some countries, there is even a defence that can be made to attempt to explain why you have harmed a woman or an LGBTQ plus person. In Bolivia, for example, there's a crime called a stupro, which minimises charges for the rape of girls aged 14 to 18, blaming it on carnal desire caused by seduction or deceit. Until recently in America, the gay panic or trans panic defense was brought up in court to try to justify why men kill gay people or trans people, often in the context of being deceived. Around the world, crimes against LGBTQ plus people are not prosecuted because it's illegal or despicable to be LGBTQ plus. When I brought up the fact that justice is rarely skewed in favor of trans people, Lala told me about a problem she perceived that the police often prejudice who the aggressor was. This reminded me of the case of Aisha Love and her friend Tiffany Gooden, two trans women who were filling up their car at a petrol station in Chicago in March 2012, when men began yelling abuse at them. One of the men punched Love, so the women got in the car and tried to drive away, only to be blocked by one of the men's cars, the other tried to prise open the women's driver's door. They tried to turn the car around and in doing so injured one of the attackers. Love and Gooden escaped, but when Love later went to the police station to file a report, she was booked for aggravated assault, which was later updated to first degree attempted murder. She was sent to jail on an attempted murder charge at a men's prison, which did not correspond with her lived gender, putting her at great physical and psychological risk. Two months after the attack, Gooden was stabbed to death and her body found in an abandoned building. She was 19. We have a culture where you can do something to a trans person and there is no recourse, said Lala. The convictions are rare and the turnaround is high. It's like a granted permission to attack trans women. In New York, there might be something, but in Arkansas or Ohio, there's not going to be a conversation. It's going to be washed away. Thanks.